Decades after the verdict was reached, many still scratch their heads at how O.J. Simpson was found not guilty for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. It was the trial watched around the world, and it didn't go especially smoothly. The murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman occurred sometime between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. on June 12, 1994. However, shortly after 11 that night, O.J. Simpson got into a waiting limo, which took him to Los Angeles International Airport to board a flight to Chicago. On Sunday night, O.J. Simpson was taking off in the red eye in first class. 20 minutes later, his ex-wife and a friend were found dead outside her home. The bodies of his ex-wife and Goldman were discovered shortly after midnight, and by noon on June 13th, O.J. Simpson was back in Los Angeles, where he was questioned by police, but not arrested. In fact, he wasn't arrested until four days later on June 17th, even though police had noted the presence of bloodstains on his white Ford Bronco and had discovered a glove on his property that seemed to match one found near the bodies. To an outside observer, it might seem ludicrous not to place O.J. under arrest. However, fame seems to extend to many unexpected corners of the human experience. As UCLA law professor Peter Aranella explained in an analysis of the case by PBS, his celebrity status explains why he wasn't arrested very early on in the case when the average defendant, given the blood evidence, would have been arrested immediately. The detectives handled him not like a criminal suspect, but like a celebrity. In the early afternoon of June 17th, the police announced that O.J. Simpson was indeed a suspect in the murders and that they were actively seeking to bring him in. For a few tense hours, it actually appeared as though one of the most beloved figures in U.S. sports history might go on the lam from the authorities. However, at around 6 p.m. that evening, Simpson himself called 911 to report his whereabouts. As it turned out, he was in the backseat of his friend's white Ford Bronco, heading at a leisurely speed down the freeway, a gun to his head and the owner of the vehicle Al Cowling's behind the wheel. For the rest of that evening, local and national news covered the unfolding drama as Simpson, threatening suicide, slowly made his way toward his Brentwood estate. The chase was watched by millions of people and surely raised questions about how, months later, Simpson could possibly plead not guilty to the crimes when his actions on that surreal day seemed to so clearly broadcast his guilt. Years after the fact, in an interview for Fox TV, Simpson explained himself by saying that he had watched all of the considerable public esteem he had massed over the years suddenly disappear and that when his ex-wife and her friend were killed, he felt as if he too had been killed. Brian and Nicole were, were physically dead, and it's almost like they killed me. Who I was, was, was attacked and murdered also. When the trial was initially set to take place in Santa Monica, where the crime was committed, it has long been thought that it was ultimately moved to downtown Los Angeles to avoid the appearance of bias, as Santa Monica is predominantly white. Indeed, Simpson ended up with a jury predominantly composed of eight black jurors. However, William Hodgman, one of the lead prosecutors on the case, claims the notion that the prosecution was trying to avoid having their famous black client tried in front of a mostly white jury is a misconception. Speaking with PBS, Hodgman explained that, at the time, most major cases in the entirety of Los Angeles County were being tried downtown, and by filing charges against Simpson there rather than in Santa Monica, the prosecution was just trying to get on with the proceedings. He explained, it was a practical awareness that the case was going to be tried here, so let's not beat around the bush. Let's get the case queued up and let's get it going. Prosecutors Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden ran point on the trial, and to attorneys monitoring the case, it quickly became apparent that they may not have had the most focused strategy. They opened not with the physical evidence against O.J. Simpson, but on Simpson's alleged history of domestic violence against his ex-wife. It was an opening volley that foreshadowed a troubling tendency by the prosecution to get lost on tangents, belabor relatively trivial points, and fail to clarify the most important ones, tendencies that Judge Lance Ito failed to rein in time and again. Unfortunately, as author and attorney Scott Turo pointed out during a conversation with PBS, the prosecution's seeming inability to focus caused the trial to drag on for over a year, making it the longest criminal trial in California history. Speaking on how it took prosecutors six months to make their case, Turo reflected, the jury is going to be left with either one of two impressions. Either your evidence is overwhelming, or you're laboring day by day to make it appear to be better than it is. And unfortunately, in this case, it was the latter impression that the jury got left with. Ordinarily, the testimony of the first cops to arrive on the scene of a murder would be invaluable, but the prosecutors in the O.J. Simpson trial made a grave error in relying on the testimony of Mark Furman. Furman was called to testify largely about the evidence collected at the scene. In fact, he was the one who found the bloody glove on Simpson's property. During his testimony for the prosecution, he performed well, but when he came under a blistering cross-examination by the legendary attorney F. Lee Bailey, things fell apart quickly. At one point, Bailey asked Furman whether he had ever used the N-word, with Furman replying that he had not. Unbeknownst to him, Simpson's defense had hours of interviews between Furman and an aspiring screenwriter, during which Furman spewed racial slurs, condoned excessive force in falsifying reports, and boasted that it would be no sweat for a cop to get away with murder. 
Furman was now facing perjury charges, and suddenly the defense's assertion that he had planted the glove on Simpson's property didn't seem so far-fetched. When he was later recalled to the stand to testify about whether he had ever planted evidence, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in response to all queries. Speaking with PBS, Prosecutor William Hogston acknowledged that his team knew Furman was problematic, but inexplicably chose to take their chances. Even more inexplicable was the trial's single most dramatic moment. In a courtroom demonstration masterminded by Prosecutor Christopher Darden, prosecutors pretty much bet the house on the bloody gloves found at the crime scene and O.J. Simpson's estate being the smoking gun. Following Mark Furman's testimony regarding the gloves, the prosecutors asked Simpson to get up from the defense table and put them on. This decision would go down in legal history as perhaps the biggest mistake any prosecuting attorney has ever made. As Judge Lance Ito instructed Simpson to move toward the jury, Simpson visibly struggled with the gloves. Speaking with Law & Crime, Dan Abrams, a court TV reporter at the time, reflected on the demonstration, explaining how many were shocked by prosecutors' decision to have Simpson try them on. He explained, We assumed if they were moving forward with it, they must know that it's going to fit. But the exasperation on the face of Chris Darden told us everything we needed to know. Disaster. To say that that demonstration backfired would be an egregious understatement. Not only did the jury get a made-for-TV moment that further cast doubt on Furman's testimony, but Simpson's team was handed a killer punchline for defense attorney Johnny Cochran's closing argument. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. To this day, it's not known whether Mark Furman or any other investigators actually planted any of the evidence against O.J. Simpson. Given the seemingly open and shut nature of the case, it doesn't make much sense on the surface for them to have done so. Even so, a great deal of defense testimony was dedicated to poking holes in the physical evidence, such as a bloody sock that a defense expert testified was likely not being worn when it came into contact with blood. Furthermore, Furman's choice to plead the fifth when asked directly of evidence tampering certainly didn't aid the prosecution against the rumors. Speaking with PBS, Simpson defense attorney Sean Chapman Holly put forth a plausible hypothesis as to why prosecutors would want to plant evidence despite already believing he'd committed the crime. She explained, I think they thought he was guilty and they were trying to make their case a little more airtight. What they weren't counting on is the just thoroughness of this defense team being able to find where they framed him and the mistakes that they made. Incredibly, the prosecution's failure to present compelling information to the jury extended beyond evidence. A pair of witnesses, both of whom were willing to testify, were passed over by Prosecutor Marsha Clark. Neither Jill Shively, who nearly got into a car accident with Simpson as he was allegedly speeding away from the scene of the crime, and Skip Junis, who spotted Simpson at Los Angeles International Airport disposing of something he was carrying in one of his bags, got a chance to testify. In the case of Shively, Clark declined to have her testify after she appeared on the tabloid TV show Hard Copy, having sold her story for $5,000. She said that Simpson was screaming through the streets at a high rate of speed and blazed through a red light as she watched. In response, a livid Clark dropped plans to put her on the stand, feeling she had blown her own credibility with her actions. As for Junis, Inside Edition suggests the things Simpson threw out could have been essential pieces of evidence, and he would later tell the outlet that he had no earthly idea why he wasn't called to testify. I said, you know, I don't understand why you haven't called me uh, to talk about this, because I thought this might be of, of interest. For all of the tangents explored and ill-advised areas of inquiry with which O.J. Simpson's prosecutors became sidetracked, it's fair to say that perhaps their strongest card was one that went severely underplayed, the DNA evidence. Forensic scientist Gary Sims testified that the blood samples found in O.J. Simpson's Bronco were a match for O.J. Simpson, Nicole Brown Simpson, and Ronald Goldman. Notably, Simpson and Goldman had never met before the night of Goldman's death, so this evidence would be pretty compelling. During her closing argument, Marsha Clark did mention the presence of Goldman's blood in the Bronco, but it came amid a storm of largely unrelated information that likely confused jurors more than aided her point. As Hodgman expressed in his chat with PBS, prosecution may have been overly confident in the jury being able to follow them, as they painstakingly painted a picture involving myriad evidence, both physical and circumstantial, over the course of the grueling trial. Indeed, during Christopher Darden's closing argument, he simply repeated many parts of the dizzying array of details Clark had already hammered the exhausted jurors with, failing to drive home her point about the crucial DNA evidence. Today, it's safe to say that most impartial observers believe that there is, at the very least, a fair chance that O.J. Simpson is guilty of the murders of his ex-wife and her friend. With this belief being so widespread, it's hard to understand how he was not found guilty. While the trial's outcome obviously hinged on a variety of factors, the legal experts who spoke with PBS for their analysis of the case seem to agree that, somewhat fittingly, a football analogy might best explain Simpson's acquittal. The determined, experienced defense came ready to play. The overconfident, inexperienced prosecution did not, and Simpson's dream team was essentially able to game a flawed system. One member of that team, though, doesn't see it that way. 
Alan Dershowitz, one of Simpson's attorneys, suggested during a sit-down with PBS that the Simpson case was one in which the system actually worked too well for the comfort of those watching the trial unfold on their TV screens. He observed, The public much prefers the old system, in which the prosecution really doesn't have to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution really doesn't have to abide by the Constitution. The prosecution really doesn't have to play fair with all the evidence. Evidently, OJ's innocence is not beyond the realm of possibility, and it's tough to say what any one of us would do if we suddenly found ourselves accused of a horrifying crime we did not commit. However, it's likely few of us would write a book about how we would have committed the crime for which we were falsely accused. Even so, this is exactly what Simpson did, and in 2007, he announced a book originally titled If I Did It, This Is How It Happened. Simpson's Fox TV interview, recorded shortly before the book's planned release, featured his first-person account of just how it might have happened, though this hypothetical confession seemed at many points anything but hypothetical. The book's release was blocked, and in a stunning twist, the bankruptcy court awarded its copyright to the family of Ronald Goldman. They opted to publish the book under the title If I Did It, Confessions of the Killer, with a preface by Goldman's sister Kim. Simpson's stated reason for writing the book was to provide financial security for his and Nicole's children, but now any proceeds will go to satisfy the Goldman's civil judgment against him.